Welcome to this next video in the playlist on field theory. In this video we have a very simple but very important theorem to prove, okay? Namely that the intersection of two field extensions is another field extension. Okay, so let's say that L is a field extension of F. And let's also say that we've got two intermediate field extensions that are in between F and L, okay? So let's say we have K1 and K2, which are both in between F and L, okay? So F is going to be a subfield of both K1 uh, and also K2, so I'll just put K2 underneath it here, and both of these are then going to be subfields of the larger field, L. Okay, so let me draw a picture for this. That's probably going to be the best thing that I can do to get across what I mean here. Okay, so we'll have the largest field, capital L, shown by the largest box here. So L can be coloured in in orange here. So this is our largest field, L. And now let's put the smallest field on next. So we'll have F right at the bottom here. So this is this little box here is going to be F, and we'll have F. Uh, coloured in or outlined in pink here, and now both K1 and K2 are going to be intermediate uh, field extensions. They're going to be containing F as a subfield, but they themselves are going to be contained within the largest field extension, which is L. Okay, so if I add them on now, let's have uh, K1 here, so let's say all of that is K1, and I'll colour in K1 I think in green here, so all of this is K1, and now let me put K2 on here, so here then, this box here, this can be K2, and have I got another colour we can use for K2? I think I'll do K2 in yellow, not probably the best choice, it probably won't show up that well, but at least I hope this picture has got across what we're doing here. Okay, we've got these two different intermediate fields in between the smallest field F and the largest field L. And now the great claim here is that if you look at the intersection of these two, so K1 intersect K2, that that is a field extension of F. And I should just add that K1 is a field extension of F, and K2 is obviously a field extension of F as well. They're both uh, fields which contain F completely. Okay, and the claim now is that K1 intersect K2 is going to be a field extension of F. Now, what is K1 intersect K2? Well, on this picture, it's all of this portion that I'm highlighting in red, the bit that's both in K1 and in K2. Okay, so the job for this video then is to prove that the intersection of these two field extensions, K1 and K2, which are field extensions of F, is another field extension. Okay, so the first thing that I want to show, the easiest thing to show, is that it actually does contain F as a subfield. And then what we want to show is that it itself is a subfield of the larger field, capital L. Okay, so really this is just an observation rather than something that requires proof. F is going to be a subfield of K1 intersect K2. I know that symbol is subset, but it is going to be a subfield because we know it's a field. Okay, uh, so hopefully that should be obvious because F is completely contained in K1 and it's completely contained in K2 if both K1 and K2 are field extensions of F. Okay, so when we intersect K1 and K2 together, all of the elements of F are going to be in that both of them, and therefore they're going to end up in the intersection. Okay, so F is going to be completely contained within K1 intersect K2. Okay, so this is looking good. Uh, what we now want to show is that K1 intersect K2 is a sub field of the larger field L, okay, and then we can truly conclude that it is a field extension of the smaller field F, okay, so we need to prove effectively that the intersection of these two fields, K1 and K2, these two subfields of L, is going to give us another subfield, okay. So, uh, what do we need to check in order to check K1 intersect K2 is a subfield? Well, it's certainly a subset, and we need to make sure that with the restricted addition and multiplication laws on it from the largest field L, that it actually is a field in its own right. Okay, so we need to make sure that it obeys the axioms in the abelian group, and that multiplication obeys all of those six axioms that we require for a field. Okay, so, the first bit, abelian group, is very simple, okay? 
because K1 and K2, with the restricted addition laws on them, are just subgroups of L. So now we're just limiting our attention down to addition. Forget about multiplication. If we view L as just being a set with addition defined on it, then this is just an abelian group, and K1 and K2 are just subgroups of that abelian group. And when you intersect two subgroups together, we know from basic group theory that you do indeed end up with another subgroup. Okay, so I can very quickly um, conclude that K1 intersect K2 is going to be an abelian group under addition. Of course, uh, any subset with the restricted addition law on from an abelian group is also going to have an abelian addition law. Okay, so we can add the abelian portion there. So it is indeed an abelian group under addition, so we don't need to worry about that. Group theory takes care of that. So let's just go now to multiplication and make sure that the restricted multiplication law on K1 intersect K2 obeys the axioms that we need it to obey in order for K1 intersect K2 to be a field. Okay, so there are six axioms we need to check then. So let's start off with multiplicative closure. Okay, so we need to prove that no matter which two elements, A and let's say B, that you pick from this set, Okay, so pick A and B from K1 into set K2. We need to make sure that A multiplied by B is another element in K1 into set K2. Okay, so we need to make sure that if you multiply any two elements in K1 into set K2 together, the answer is still in K1 into set K2. This is multiplicative closure. In fact, I might even call this axiom number one, as we would usually call it for uh, fields. Okay, right, so... Uh, multiplicative closure, why is this going to be true? Well, if we know that A and B are in K1 intersect K2, then we know that A and B are both in K1 and in K2. Because K1 and K2 are both fields, they are closed under multiplication, and that means that A times B is going to have to be in K1, and it's going to have to be in K2, because both A and B are in K1 and K2. And because A times B is in both K1 and K2, it follows that A times B is in K1 intersect K2. So these are very, very simple arguments. Okay, so because K1 and K2 are uh, subfields of L, we can conclude that the intersection of the two is closed under multiplication. Axiom number two is associativity. Do we need to worry about whether the restricted multiplication law is going to obey associativity or not? The answer is no. Okay, Whenever you restrict down an associative multiplication law, it's still going to obey associativity. Okay, If it didn't, then it wouldn't obey it when it was part of the larger multiplication table uh, on the largest field L here. So we do not need to worry about associativity, so I'll skip out axiom number two. Axiom number three, where we will jot down, even though it's very simple, we need to make sure that the multiplicative identity is in K1 intersect K2. Well, of course, the multiplicative identity will be in F, and F is certainly in K1 intersect K2. So we don't need to worry about that as well. One will be in K1 intersect K2. The fourth axiom that we need to make sure of is that all non-additive identity elements have a multiplicative inverse. So for all A is an element of K1 intersect K2, except uh, the additive identity, so A is not equal to the additive identity, we need to make sure that 1 over A, the multiplicative inverse of A, is in K1 intersect K2 here. Okay, right. Uh, so how can we be sure of this? Well, again, it follows directly from the fact that K1 and K2 are subfields. So because K1 and K2 are subfields, and we know that if A is in K1 intersect K2, A is in both K1 and it's in K2, because we know they're both subfields, we know that they must both contain the multiplicative inverse for A. Okay, otherwise they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't have multiplicative inverses for all non-additive identity elements, and hence we can conclude that the multiplicative inverse for A is also in the intersection of K1 with K2 because it's in both K1 and K2. So very, very simple argument there as well. Axiom number five is commutativity. Again, we don't need to worry about that. It's like associativity. If it obeys that on the multiplication table for the largest uh, 
field L here, okay, then when we restrict the multiplication table down to a subset, it will still obey commutativity and distributivity. Again, we don't need to worry about that. If the addition of multiplication tables on the largest field L obey distributivity, then when we restrict the addition of multiplication tables down to a subset of L, uh, they will still obey distributivity. Otherwise, the restricted tables, when viewed as part of the larger tables, would not obey distributivity. So we don't actually need to worry about distributivity. Okay, so the complicated ones we don't need to worry about in this case. Okay, so it's extremely easy to show then that K1 intersect K2 is indeed a subfield. Okay, so I've got a subfield of the largest field capital L, which completely contains my field capital F, and therefore it is indeed a field extension of uh, capital F. So K1 intersect K2 is a field extension of capital F. So if you intersect two field extensions together, you get another field extension. Okay, right. So we have now proven the main result of this uh, video. However, what I want to do, the reason I'm bringing this up at all, okay, is that it has an important application to something that we've seen earlier on in this playlist and which I want to now do a little bit more rigorously. Okay, so I'll put this as a corollary then. Okay, oh, how have I spelled that? Corolla, oh no, it's going fine. Corollary. I thought that was all bad spelling for a moment, but no, I was just looking at it strangely. Okay, so corollary. Uh, the corollary, then, is going to be about something I introduced you to in the uh, video on field extensions, namely the field generated by a bunch of elements. So let me just remind you, what we're going to be talking about is the field f of alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n, which means the field generated by alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. Okay, so this is something that I define in the video on field extensions, but we don't really do it that rigorously, but now what I want to do is talk about it with more rigour. Okay, so let me just draw a picture then for this. So here uh, is my larger field, and I'll stick with calling it capital L just to be consistent. Okay, and let's say we've got some smaller field, capital F here. Okay, so I've got L, which is a field extension over F. Then, in the video on field extensions, we talked about generating this field called the field generated by alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n over f. Okay, and at the time I said that it would be the smallest subfield of the field extension L which contained f completely, so it was a field extension of f, but it also had to contain these elements alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n, and we'd usually think about these being outside of capital F, like so. So alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way down to, let's say, alpha n here. Okay, so here are these uh, elements that are outside of capital F, and then we're trying to build the smallest subfield of capital L that contains F and all of these elements, and that's what we mean by the field generated by alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. Now, that was my original definition, and that did for the time being, but now what I want to do is explore that with a little bit more rigour. What do I mean by the smallest subfield uh, of um, the larger field, capital L, that contains F and all those elements. Okay, well, I meant all of the elements that absolutely have to be there the instant that you put these elements in. Okay, that's what I meant. Uh, the elements that you cannot get away with not having. Okay, that was what we were going to build here. But let me make that absolutely rigorous now. So, the way that you will construct something like this, and of course, one of the particular cases which we're very interested in is the simple extension where you're just adding in a single element. Okay, that we're just here talking about the more general case, but you could think about just adding in a single element. Okay, so what we mean by this is look at all intermediate fields, which I'll call K. Okay, so look at all intermediate fields that are in between F and L. So look at every single intermediate field K, which completely contains F, and which also completely contains all of these elements. So alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n are all in K. So if you look at absolutely every single subfield of L, which contains F, and all of these elements that I want, and then intersect every single one of these together, 
okay? So all the intermediate fields that satisfy this, the condition that they completely contain F and all of these elements, I want you to now intersect them all together. Okay, and I know I've just put one here. How can I uh, make this... Um, how can I change this? I have an index here, i. Okay, so you're now going to sum over some index set, which I'll call i, or rather intersect over some index set, i. Okay, so you intersect all of the intermediate fields between f and l, which contain all of these elements, and the structure that you end up with, this will be another field extension of f, okay? and it will be the smallest field extension. It will be the field extension that is contained within all the other field extensions that are field extensions of F and contain all of these elements. So it will truly be the smallest field extension of F which contains all of these elements, alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. So alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. Now let me just um, say something here that's important. You could be performing an infinite intersection here, potentially. Of course, I've proven that if you intersect two field extensions together, that you get another field extension. And of course, once you've done it for two, it's very easy to then say, OK, for an arbitrary finite string of field extensions intersected together, I get a field extension. But infinite, that's something else entirely, OK? It's not usually responsible to conclude that because it works in the finite case, it will work in the infinite case. However, in this case, it is true that if I intersect together an infinite number of these field extensions, I will get another field extension. And the reason is that I can be sure that this intersection is not going to be empty because it will always, always contain F. OK, and you can actually verify for yourself, it's not difficult at all, that all of these verifications that we've just done, the fact that it will always be an abelian group and that these will be true, will actually hold even if you're intersecting together an infinite number of field extensions. So truly, you can intersect together a finite number of field extensions of F and get another field extension of F, and it even extends to an infinite case. You can intersect together an infinite number of field extensions of F and you will still end up with a field extension of F, okay? Uh, do try and verify that for yourself. It's not po difficult to see that these arguments will all still hold if we're intersecting an infinite number of them together, okay? You might also have to dissect down the abelian group uh, verification, so you'll have to put in additive, closure, uh, the presence of the additive identity, and the presence of additive inverses for this one. You won't need to worry about additive associativity or uh, additive commutativity, so it'll be just like this, but for addition as well. And you can verify that all six of those axioms do indeed still hold up when we're talking about intersecting together an infinite number of field extensions rather than just a finite number. Okay, so to stress again then, here is your more rigorous definition of the field generated by alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. Okay, you look at absolutely all intermediate fields, okay, which we'll call these k's. Okay, so here is an example of k. It's an intermediate field, it's a subfield of L, and it might not necessarily have to be a proper subfield. Okay, it's a subfield of L that completely contains F and all of these elements, alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. You find all such subfields that satisfy those conditions, you intersect them all together. We know that the intersection will still be a field extension of capital F. We also know that it will have to contain all of F and all of alpha 1, alpha 2, all the up to alpha n because all of those elements are contained within all of these ki's. Okay, so when we intersect them all together, we will still end up with alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n in there, and that will now truly be the smallest field extension um, of f that contains all of those elements in L. Okay, uh, so that is your more rigorous account of what we mean by the field generated by alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way up to alpha n. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video.